nostalgic for our eight-year-old selves. Yeah. But with the name, we just kind of felt misunderstood, and maybe that we were getting publicity for something that wasn't what we were. But we did choose the name. We look back years later, because people would always say, that was the thing that really broke you, wasn't it? And we would try to deny it, and we're later we're like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Page rode the roller coaster of entertainment popularity as one of the most recognizable voices in the bare naked ladies, from playing in basements to appearing on Jay Leno and David Letterman. But the stresses of the job, a much publicized drug bust, and a desire to forge his own path led him to leave the band and strike out on his own. We met up with him at the BAMP School in Alberta, where he was rehearsing an almost full orchestra performance of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album. Steve, have you come from a musical family at all? Uh, yeah, my parents were and are avid music lovers. My father was a drummer, uh, played in jazz bands and dance bands, like from high school on. I remember as a kid, um, you know, he'd go out, he'd have a gig. And he was a teacher. Both my parents were teachers okay. by trade. And uh, but he'd have gigs, uh, you know, occasionally or New Year's Eve or whatever else. He was never around. Um, so that was always that was always kind of part of the household. My mother. Went to the uh, Oscar Peterson School of Jazz Music Appreciation, okay. which used to be in Rosedale in Toronto, on Rosedale Valley Road, or Park Road, one of those, where he had a house, and like Oscar and Ed Digpen and Ray Brown and would teach these music appreciation oh, courses. Oh, dear Lord. So okay. she has, has this huge collection of great classic jazz records. I bet. So we grew up with that, and then um, my dad uh, worked at the Mariposa Festival okay. his best friend was one of the guys responsible for bringing it down from Aurelia down to Toronto Island. Okay. And then his friend who had run it moved to Australia in 1969. So my dad was the chairman uh, from 69 to 72, which was kind of the heyday. I, so I yeah. was there during those years. That's, That's yeah, yeah, okay, interesting. So I always had lots of great stories about, you know, James Taylor or Taj Mahal or Pete Seeger. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the year that Dylan came to the island and everybody yeah. freaked out, that kind of stuff. So Excellent. Did you, so did you hang around Mariposa at the time? Were you well, absorbing that stuff? You know, I was, I was born in 70. So okay. from, yeah, from the ages of zero to five, I was there every <laughs> summer. But okay. I have the only memory I have of that, really, is I remember being on the ferry and Pete Seeger being on the same ferry. So right. And I knew who he was at okay. that point. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in high school, were you, a, like, you were a cool kid or you were a nerd? Oh, totally a nerd. Yeah. We were, I was, I went to a gifted program okay. from grade four onward, and I was kind of a young kid compared to everybody else. I had skipped a grade early on, and when you're a year apart from everybody else, you feel like you're yes. ten years apart. When, yeah. you're, when you're eight and everybody else is nine, you feel like you're eight and everybody else is 19. Yeah. Um, so I always kind of tried to overcompensate for that, but we were a group of nerds together, and in the 80s, by high school, we were kind of the new waiver kids, you know, trying hard to be... Well, weirdos, we kind of em embraced the freak flag and um, we're okay with kind of doing whatever. So, you know, one kid would be a, a math whiz and somebody else was into drama or art or whatever else. And I, I loved to, to sing, but I loved to sing only because it felt good. Like, I never had any ambition of being a professional singer. I okay. sang in, in choirs all the way from grade nine until the end of university. But... Uh, you know, I always just thought I'd be maybe a writer. I love literature and love to write and write stories and poems and stuff. But music was just always part of it was part just of there. life. It was yeah. just there. It was just you there. Sort of took it for granted in a way. Totally. Yeah. Like in, growing up in Scarborough, we had a really great um, borough-wide music program. You know, there was a, an all-borough orchestra and wind ensemble and choir, and they okay. would do a big music camp at the end of June every year. And that's actually how... Uh, how I met Ed Robertson. I knew Ed Robertson from, from school, but he yeah. was a different grade for me and a different clique of people. But once we were at camp together, and he's walking around with an acoustic guitar, and we were, you know, he was actually singing a song that I had written with another friend. He'd heard a tape of our songs. Um, I was like, I like this guy. But we started singing together, which you wouldn't normally do in a high school situation. Guys, no, not singing, really. You know, there's something. Yeah, yeah it's just, it, just, it, just, it seems too intimate. Yeah, um, yeah. And high school is not really about that kind of intimacy for. For most most people, and uh, but in that setting, we were okay to do that, and it was instantaneous. We knew that our voices, there was something magical. The way we you were both together. counselors at this camp, yep. right? That was the deal. Yep. But when you were in high school, my understanding from something I read somewhere was that when you actually di weren't really, f you were sort of standoffish to each Absolutely. other before that. Yeah, I, I think 
I didn't know him well enough, so I had right. a preconceived notion of him. He was, again, like a, you know, a grade below me, and, and I saw him as kind of like a tough kid, or like a little bit rougher than me, and he was into rock, you know, harder rock music, and uh, he was definitely the guitar guy, but he just had this, um, he had a, he had a, a level of self-confidence that, that threatened me. Yeah. Um, so we just didn't, weren't part of the same group of people, and then at that point, when we started going to camp together, and I did see his band play. His, he had a cover band, and they played it, this huge range of music, everything from, you know, from hard rock to, uh, you know, to the Talking Heads, mm -hmm. um, to Peter Gabriel or whatever. It was all over the place. And, and I went, oh, okay, this guy's not what I thought he was. He's way cooler. And when I started to get to know him, he was about the friendliest guy you could ever imagine mm -hmm. to meet. And when you started singing together, mm -hmm. uh, was it one of those, and I've had other musicians tell me this too, where they, they started singing with somebody and suddenly realized, well, the, la the last example, somebody we interviewed a while ago, Graham Nash, mm -hmm. and he said when he started singing with Crosby and those guys, suddenly it was just like, oh my God. Yeah, I mean, I've, he gave up everything. He, he left his wife, he left his home, he left everything and moved to Los Angeles just because of the sound. Right. I mean, he was in one of the biggest bands in England yeah. at that point. I've heard him talk about that, and it's funny when you hear somebody else uh, relate an experience that is very personal. For them and for me, like I, I can totally identify with it. Not that, yeah. not that Barenaked Ladies and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, or for CF, CSN even, are the same thing. But you know, I've always really looked up to those guys. But I know what he's talking about. That instantly, when Ed and I started singing together, <clears throat> um, even before we started writing songs together, we just knew there was a, a thing that our voices at that point, because we were young, we were 18, mm -hmm. were a lot more similar to each other as, as well. Which you know, we developed our own styles and our own tones, but uh, at that point, they were very similar. And then, within a year, we started playing with Jim and Andy Cregan. We brought them up on stage for a concert uh, at a club in Toronto at Christmas time. It was kind of almost as a joke, like we did a set as the two of us, because we always thought the band was just going to be Ed and myself. Okay. And then we, we, for the second half, we said, well, here's our band, kind of like it was a <laughs> joke. We had rehearsed it in Ed's parents' basement for a few days before, and we knew, again, right away, from the first note, we knew that with Jim and Andy in the group, it was something magical. Yeah. What year was that? Do you remember? 19, well, Ed and I started in 88, so it would be in Christmas time, 89, okay. that we played with the Cregans. Okay, you mentioned Mariposa earlier, because uh, I saw you guys play at Mariposa when it was in Barrie. Yeah. And that would have been, if I'm trying to remember now, what I would have thought. I would have thought 89, but it might have been 90. Yeah, it might have been 90. It was, uh, it was a small stage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I didn't know who you were. It was the name that intrigued me, sure. i got to tell you. Yeah. I went, wow, Bare Naked Ladies. Could there be a more Canadian name? That was what was <laughs> going on in my head, right? I was down there doing interviews, and so I went over to see you guys. That was the first time I saw you. Yeah, we did, we did it early um, there, and we did it when they first brought it back down to Ontario Place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being on the stage with a lot of or in workshops with people that I really looked up to yeah. was really exciting. But I remember we started doing the folk festival circuit in Canada, and uh, you know, there's a friction sometimes between the new or when they feel like they're bringing in. You know, other people think, oh, they're bringing in the, just the new rock group in order to, or the novelty group, whatever, to bring yeah, the get more people there in there. But yeah. it's not the real thing. No. Um, <laughs> it still goes on today. Oh, it's always <laughs> like that. I've <just laughs> done them in the last few years, and sometimes you just click with people, and sometimes there's people who are just really, really rigid. Yeah. I remember doing the Winnipeg Folk Festival in 92, and it was right before Gordon came out, and we were really hot at that time. Yeah. People were very excited for the record to come out, and, but we were 21, 22 years old, and um, goofs. And I remember they had these, uh, these um, singers, the Tuvan Ensemble from Tuva near, near mm -hmm. um, Siberia, and they sang very similar to uh, Inuit throat singing, um, but with, you know, they could sing two tones at once. It was quite remarkable. Yeah. And, we're, um, and so we went up on stage, on the main stage at this point. We're like, ah, what's the big deal with those guys? We can do that. And, you know, Ed, I'd go, and Ed would go, and we'd do, pretend we were doing it right. ourselves. Right. Right. I'm guys. thinking that went over like a ton of bricks. Well, exactly. All the, <laughs> all the people in the audience were kind of like, <laughs> we look over the side of the stage, and the Tuvan guys are all watching, laughing their heads off. <laughs> Good for them. That was, yeah. And that was kind of like what we loved about do, doing the band in the early days was the people who got it were the right yeah. people, the people that we like, and we yeah. could then we could have a great connection with those kinds yeah. of people. What was the break? When did the break come? Well, it was a few things. You know, it started off. Our first break was actually getting discovered by Corky and the Juice Pigs, the Canadian comedy group. All right, and this with Sean Cullen, a lot of people know. Um, we were huge fans of theirs. And, you know, Ed and I were in university, and 
He'd call me and say, okay, Corky, these picks are playing at Western tonight. Uh, I got my mom's car. Can I pick you up in half an hour? And he'd pick me up, and we'd drive out to London and see them and drive home that night. Um, and we'd have it, we had a tape that we'd made in our basement, and uh, we gave it to them. And every time we'd see them, it's like, oh, did you hear the tape? And they'd say, ah, no, not, not yet. <laughs> and then one day, Sean said, I, I listened to it, and it's great. And do you guys want to go on tour with us as our opening act? Um, and we were at this point where it was really just a fun thing we were doing. We were going to school and not really thinking this was a real thing. We were kind of sideswiped by the offer. Yeah. Um, so we sat down with my dad and Corky the Juice Pig's manager and so on. And then we walked through the whole tour. My dad said, how about this? Take a year. Um, pursue this seriously. And at the end of the year, if you want to go back to school because you, feel, you feel like you've done it and that's it, then go back to school. And if you feel like it's going upwards, then go upwards. Wow. Yeah, I didn't have the kind of parents who were like, uh, <laughs> you've you know, got to get an education. Yeah, fall, find something to fall back on. <laughs> yeah. It's like, do this, and then if it doesn't work, then do something else. Yeah. Um, you know, he knew that it was important to commit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we learned a lot. We learned a lot on that tour about how to put a show together, how to relate to an audience, how not yeah. to. Uh, how to exist together. In the but road. that's pretty much being thrown into the f deep end of the pool like Absolutely. right away. We were playing everything from university pubs to, you know, really rough and tumble bars and stuff. And it was, uh, you know, right, driving across Canada in a van. It was a great yeah. experience, but it was trial by fire for sure. That was kind of our first break. But every time we kind of had a growth, we thought we had made it. Like we started playing residencies in Toronto and Ottawa and so on where we play like every... Tuesday in Toronto, every Wednesday in Ottawa, or vice versa, and drive back and forth. And so we were very determined to not be a Toronto band, yeah. you know, and especially in the in the late '80s, early '90s. It was a real kind of people were identified as Toronto bands. So that's why we always said we were a Scarborough band because <laughs> we thought it's so uncool to say that. Let's say <laughs> yes. it. Um, and we wanted to be a Canadian band. We just yeah. wanted to be everywhere across the country. So we did as much of that as we could. And things like being on Morningside with Peter Zosky, like yeah. it was a, got us to an audience that much music wouldn't have. But much music got us to a different audience. It was a perfect time where we could go and, you know, actually just show up at much music and play on the floor there. Or have a radio station like CFMY in Toronto or CBC Radio that would yeah. fund a recording. Those kinds of opportunities aren't really there the same way for, for bands now. Yeah. But the big thing was the City Hall thing, when, when we got banned from playing at Toronto City Hall. Yeah, okay. Let's talk about that a little bit. That was Mel Lastman, right? It was, no, it was, it was um, the... June Rollins, okay. so who, uh, she had, I guess her office had booked us for their New Year's Eve celebration. Mm -hmm. Then we found out, I guess, in the fall that they had decided that our name was offensive and objectified women was the phrase they used. And we kind of went, oh, that's a drag. But We'll get another gig, and we got a gig at McMaster University in Hamilton and didn't think about it. But a couple days before New Year's, somebody at the Toronto Star had found out about it. And actually, I think the Sun reported it first, and then the Star called us and said, can, you, can we meet you down at Nathanville Square? We'll have a picture taken with you. And they put it on the front page of the paper. Um, and it became huge news. We were really embarrassed by it because, you know, we thought... First of all, we figured people already knew who we were, but they didn't. People who were into new music might, but it wasn't across the yeah. country's consciousness. Yeah. And this way, it was, there's Peter Mansbridge talking about us on the news and whatever else. And, and, and <laughs> we didn't want to be the poster children for the anti-PC movement. You know, it was the time of yeah. Andrew Dice Clay or Sam Kinison yeah. or those kinds of things. We weren't part of that. Like most of the tenets of being politically correct, we agreed with. We don't want to hurt people. We were being nostalgic for our eight-year-old selves yeah. by, with the name. We just kind of felt <laughs> misunderstood and maybe that we were getting publicity for something that wasn't what we were. But we did choose the name. We looked back years later because people would always say, that was the thing that really broke you, wasn't it? And we'd try to deny it. And we're later we're like, yeah, it kind of was. <laughs> it was. What are some, when, when you guys were, were still tight and still together and still getting along and mm -hmm. everything, what were some of the peaks for you. I remember seeing you on, I don't know, was it Leno or something one night at the Bunchy? I mean, you were, you, you were there. Yeah, we kind of did all yeah. the things. It was, uh, and it was a long ride. Well, it was a, a very gratifying ride because, you know, we worked hard in Canada, not as long and hard as some bands do. And we realized in retrospect that some people went, well, it's kind of overnight and they didn't earn it. But we'd done our share of coast to coast band tours and sleeping on floors yeah, and all that stuff. Dues, we sure. felt like we paid our dues put a record out that we funded ourselves and uh, you know, never 
we're in debt to the record company, even if we didn't have any success in the U.S. for the first six years. Mm. Um, it was this kind of slow build. But then as things started to kind of peter out in Canada around the time of our second record, we kind of had to start working in the U.S. more in order to just stay busy and, and, and build an audience. Yeah. So by the time we had the big explosion with the stunt album in 98, um, we had built this audience from scratch in the U.S., and when that album came out and was kind of instantly huge, it surprised a lot of people because it, it, it had happened under the radar. Um, but we got very lucky. That was the point, the highest point ever in the history of the music business yeah. was the, the kind of the peak of the bubble. Yeah, it's all about timing, right? It really was yeah. perfect timing. And it was when, you know, regrettably is when they deregulated radio in the United States, which has been a horrible thing for music in general. Yes. But we benefited from it because all these conglomerates, you know, there's a few conglomerates who bought all these independent stations mm -hmm. around the country. Each one of the music and, and um, uh, uh, program directors from each of the stations would come into the to the uh, head office and say, well, this is a band that we broke in Detroit or a band that we broke in Boston or wherever else. And they kind of took us with them, which meant that when the single came out, it was across all the, the board. stations yeah, would play. That's perfect. Was, which yeah. was, so we, it was very lucky timing and a lot of work, but that couple of years there from about 98 yeah. to 2001 was really super exciting because we were playing in the World Music Awards and Monte Carlo and you know going to the Grammys and yeah, uh, yeah we did the Tonight Show a bunch of times one time with David Duchovny playing Shaker Egg with us <laughs> <laughs> we happened to be on another TV show at the Fox lot and bumped into David Duchovny and they were shooting the X-Files there I guess they yeah. had stopped shooting it in Vancouver and started shooting it in LA and uh he said, what show are you on? We said, oh, we're on this show, uh, two guys, a girl, at a pizza place. We had Ryan Reynolds in it. He goes, oh, losers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you know, come take a look around. He shows us around the X-Files set. We were big fans, so we were yeah. excited. And he goes, you guys do anything else when we're in, while you're in town? We said, well, we're on the Tonight Show tomorrow. He goes, well, so am I. And I said, seriously? He goes, yeah. Can I play Shaker Egg with you? And then he made it this whole story about he graduated from Berkeley with a degree in Shaker Egg, and he learned the song. <laughs> He's right there between me and Ed for the whole thing. Those were like that's pretty cool, yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, awesome yeah, moments. Yeah. And we really always felt like we were, we knew that that peak thing was pretty temporary. Yeah. We, were, we were able to, we knew we could sustain an audience. We had a core, but that thing of mainstream success, let's just enjoy it and yeah, watch. It comes and it goes. Yeah. yeah. And so we felt we were kind of observers and. Did it have, but all of that stuff, and you talked about it being work, what, was there an impact on, on the writing and the writing stake, or I should ask you this to begin with, I guess, is, was the writing collaborative between you and Ed? Yeah, very collaborative. And yeah. did that have an effect on it then, this, the workload have an effect on the creative output of it, of the two of you? We always found it difficult to write and tour at the same time. So we would tour, and we would tour like crazy for 18 months or something, and then we'd have to take time off, decompress, and write. But we were always really good at getting together and making sure that the two of us sat down and wrote together. And sometimes there were songs you'd write individually and it was kind of like present to the other guy and mm -hmm. you go, well, it's done. But in general, we knew that the core of what the band's music was was our our joint song. Yeah. But we know we were very good about that. And even like even right down to the, the last few years of the, that I was in the group, we really worked hard to do that. By the time we did uh, Everything to Everyone, which came out in 2003, we had started to try to, to be more uh, democratic in our in our writing, spreading it across. Because you know we had really talented writers with Jim Cregan and, and Kevin yeah. Hearn, who were doing records on their own and you know, deserved to have their voices heard inside of that. But we wanted to be able to make sure that they were that they fit. Yeah. They weren't just throwing on the other guy's song yeah. as a kind of. And remainder. that always se that always seems to be the dynamic that develops in a group like this, where you have people who are talented. I mean, look, it happened to the Beatles. If it sure. happened to the Beatles, it's going to happen to everybody, right? right. But we didn't, we didn't want to throw. Uh, within you, without you, on the end of a record, and right. have it just be the other guy's song. Yeah. We wanted it to be part of the group thing. So we did a, a pretty cool thing, but it took us time. We, we Jim and, and Kevin would bring song ideas um, to Ed and myself, and then he and I would sit down together with that song idea and rewrite parts of it or add a section, and you know maybe I'd end up singing it, or maybe Ed would end up singing it, or Jim might sing it, but I'd sing a part of it, like just to make it really feel yeah. like it was part of the whole yeah. and but it was a lot of work because it wasn't the normal way that we had written but we knew for a long time probably from our second record on where i had brought in a lot of songs that I, either i'd done myself or had written with my friend stephen duffy um we knew that we were 
if we didn't pay attention to the partnership, that it could all fall apart. And uh, we were very good at, at making it democratic, yeah. but didn't always make. Um, it made for some very. Um, I don't want to say overthought. It's not the right word. It's, uh, we worked very hard on it, so it didn't have that that uh, initial spark that you have when you're making your first okay, record, right? right? Sure. Or you so just come have an idea and it comes yeah. out. Yeah. Okay. Some of it was there, and we would try for it, like a song like One Week, which was our biggest hit in the U.S. and 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 in a lot of places internationally. Most of that is essentially what we would do live. We would, in between songs, make up songs. And I still hear them. Like, I'll have them on my iPod on shuffle, and I'll hear a live bit come up. And I, sometimes, like, I'll be dying laughing. Or I'll just think, like, how did we... <laughs> People thought, oh, you wrote those in advance. And we'd be singing about the city we were playing in or whatever else. We were singing about you know, Charlotte, North Carolina or something. And the day we had walking around downtown or something... And people thought we made them up in advance, and we hadn't. But I'll hear them now, and they're so, like, everybody is so tuned into each other and listening and knows each other musically so well. Some of them are incredible. I mean, some of them are disasters. Yeah. But that's what One Week was all about. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that rapping style that, that Ed did was just a part of our live show, and we wanted to capture that. And that song, I think, was pretty spontaneous yeah. for him. Amazing. I want to ask you about, uh, you know, a few years ago you acknowledged that you suffer from bipolar disorder. And a while back, in fact, I looked it up last night, and about, about 12 years ago, I sat down with Matthew Good. In fact, we did an extremely long interview, and he talked a lot about his problems with, with anxiety, mm -hmm. really bad anxiety that he has. It's crippling for him, except when he's on stage. When he's on stage, that's the one place he feels normal. And, and when you started talking about suffering from this, and you, I know at Algonquin College in Ottawa, at one point you told people about an experience you had back in the mid-'90s, when the band was filming a video for one of your songs, I think it was Jane, and mm -hmm. you know you had to be dragged out of bed. How did this affliction affect your music, your career, or or was that the salvation for you, like like that was like it is for Matt? Um, I think I think stage is is a safe place, especially when you're with people you trust musically, um, and that's what we always did. I mean, even right up to the very end in Barney Good Ladies. There was always this intense amount of musical trust and communication on stage. It was a very safe place, a very safe place to do very risky things sometimes. You know, you could speak out, you could act out, whatever else, and be very broad uh, or very emotional on stage. Um, but it was a, it felt like a safe and contained and controlled place to do it right. because I wasn't out of control on either side of the spectrum. I was very much in control of that. Um, you know, the bipolar diagnosis is a funny thing because I've been diagnosed with a bunch of different things. It depends okay. on who you go to, right? Oh, yeah. Your right. diagnosis for mental health, it comes out of the DSM quite often. Yes. And it's the one in this book, and it's it's a checklist of, you know, they can't swab you for OCD or whatever, right. or anxiety, you know, and, and you know, get a lab result back. Yeah. So so it's just behaviors. It's behaviors yeah. and, and feelings and uh, fears and anxieties and so on, uh, patterns. And... You can kind of learn, you know, if you want to be not diagnosed with something, you can answer, you know, sure. you know, you can start to learn what the responses are you yeah. can give to somebody. If you want to be serious about how you're going to attack this, uh, the issue that you have and learn to actually live with it and have a healthy lifestyle, then you have to be honest about it. But your interpretations of, or a doctor's interpretations of the uh, um Diagnosis can be can differ. They can say, "Well, you suffer from depression. You suffer from anxiety. You suffer from bipolar disorder." So I'm a little. I, I, I don't know. Maybe yeah. maybe none. Maybe all. Yeah. Maybe all. You know, probably all. <laughs> but regardless, for me, the thing was, it did disturb me a little bit that the safe place was just on stage. I love performing, and I, I feel very comfortable in it. But it's it's also because it's something I've worked hard at. Yes. Um, and I strive to feel that in control of myself at least or at least that um, that comfortable in my regular life yeah. and I thought it was unfair to the other people around me to reserve my safe zone for a place where people could pay to see me yeah. you know? it's not yeah. fair to your kids or your parents or your loved ones so you know, in, a, in a certain way I think for me as I started to have to learn to address it all the time it's, it's it's a rigorous regime, yeah. and that's like it's easy to just give up now and again. And go, oh, I'm fine now. Um, 
sometimes it, it it's hard to respect the performance side as much because they think, well, is that just a place to escape to rather than actually well, that's the things they head on? Oh, that's interesting. Do you still feel that way about it? I have lots of questions about it. Yeah? But I think it's sometimes when you're a creative person, I think you can question why you do what you do, as a lot of people around you do. Mm -hmm. People who aren't in the creative arts might think, that it's like a vacation, or it's like it's like a um, a childhood in the sense that it's not real work. Yes. Um, unless you're out there sweating it out every day, um, and sometimes the work comes from just experience or sitting and thinking quietly, yes. or reading a book or whatever. The yes. stuff that most you're people working. Do. That's yeah. right. And most people do those things simply for pleasure, and to get do something that's yeah. pleasurable for most people. And somehow find the agony in it, <laughs> as we all tend to do occasionally. Uh, you, you don't want to be self pitying. So it says, kind of comes the cycle where it's like you feel bad for yourself, you feel misunderstood, and then you feel like you're self aggrandizing because I'm, you know, God, I get to have this great job where I get right. to do these great things. If you get too much in that loop, then you become unproductive. And, and then it all goes away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or it can all right. go away. It can, absolutely. Yeah. We have a couple minutes left, and I want to talk to you about your solo career. It, but just leading into that, I have to ask this one question. Are you still in good terms with those guys? We don't talk often, um, but, like, no ill feelings. No. I think it's – the best way I can describe it is I went through a divorce at a similar time, for a very close time to when uh, I split from the band. No matter how much, when you're getting divorced, which people would have more experience with, no matter how much you, you attempt – to say to to make it as as easy as possible and um, as copacetic as possible for everybody, it's still an upsetting thing. It's sure. a, it's emotional, and that's what we all realize. I think in the, in with Brand Naked Ladies was we had to work hard to step out from what our old identity was and respect the work we did together. But it doesn't make it less painful. Yeah. So it was. I think it's easier for us to just live our lives separately and think very yeah. fondly of what we did together. So so then stepping off and doing a career on your own, did you just suddenly discover, well, okay, I was part of that band and they were recognized as a band. I was recognized as part of it. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly on my own, as they would say in advertising, on my own brand. Right. And I have to, now I have to start promoting that. I have to make that, get that brand out there. That's right. And what is that brand? Yeah. And then you have to spend a lot of time thinking, and I, this is the part I don't like thinking about, is like, what do people, what do other people think about me? Do they think that I'm... Uh, the, the angsty guy who left the fun band because right. it's like which wasn't the case I mean so I had a lot of fun making page one my first real solo record um, after I left the band because it was it had a range of emotions it still had that the fun pop sensibilities of what people knew f from me from Bare Naked Ladies it was a nice opportunity to, for audiences to hear it and go oh it's that guy I like that thing he does and they could hear you know the serious side of Steve um, <laughs> But I, I'd already been doing a lot of other things, like yeah. working at the Stratford Festival, for example, yes, yeah. doing scores there. And, and that always tore me away from my obligations to the group. We all had different kinds of obligations. Well, now I can actually focus on that kind of stuff yeah. or the work I do with the Art of Time Ensemble. Yeah. We have run short of time, believe it or not. My goodness. I know. That's, that's I talked too hour, much. John like that. Not at all. <laughs> not hardly enough. Anyway, this has been great fun. Thank Thanks very so much. much. It was great to meet you. Thank Thanks. You, thanks.